The German U-boat, the deadliest hunter of the sea, the destroyer of thousands of souls. The name U-boat, an abbreviation of the term Unterseeboot, which literally translated means undersea boat, is a name that became synonymous with swift and deadly attacks from the depths of the ocean. Torpedoed Allied warships sinking them into the icy waters of the Atlantic Ocean after having taken them by surprise and most potent submarine fleet of the Second World War. While the U-boat's fleet's reputation for ruthless effectiveness is generally well known, a fact that perhaps is not as widely known is that these legendary submarines were ultimately almost as deadly to their operators and crews as they were to their foes. By the time the war ended, 
of the 40,900 Germans who served on U-boats, 5,000 crew were taken prisoner and 28,000 of them lost their lives. Germany's history with submarines goes back to the First World War and they were the first nation to use subs during that particular war. While their World War I fleet started out with only 38 U-boats, which were small, almost flimsy watercraft, each no larger than a thousand tons, they proved to be tremendously effective against British warships and later against the American merchant vessels, sinking more than 10,000 tons throughout the duration of the war. While the armistice of 1918 forced Germany to surrender its entire U-boat fleet, the Treaty of Versailles prevented them from constructing any more. The effectiveness of the U-boat fleet was not forgotten by Germany's military leadership. Soon after Hitler took power, he made the restoration of Germany's U-boat fleet one of his priorities. After repudiating the Treaty of Versailles in 1934 and withdrawing Germany from the League of Nations in 1935, Hitler began a program of rearmament. This, of course, included the construction of a fleet of U-boats. In 1939, when the Second World War broke out, Germany had only managed to construct 57 U-boats, but these new U-boats were far sturdier and technologically advanced than their World War I predecessors. Featuring heat-seeking torpedoes, large gun decks, a spiderweb mines, these 57 submarines were used with tremendous effectiveness against the British warships and merchant vessels, which were prepared for undersea warfare. During the first phase of the war, each U-boat operated alone. They had to update their tactics when Allied ships began to travel with escorts trained to counter the U-boat threat, as well as Allied warplanes which worked to spot and destroy the U-boats from the sky. To counter this, the U-boats began travelling and operating in groups which were given the ominous sounding moniker Wolf Packs by the British. The U-boats also strived to become more stealthy, surfacing only under the cover of darkness and striking when least expected. Often one U-boat would shadow an Allied convoy and then, when conditions were ripe for a strike, call in the other members of the wolf pack to launch a combined attack. The Allies soon upped their game. However, the developments in radar technology meant that the U-boat's potential for stealth became diminished. In addition, the Allies began to develop a specific anti-submarine weapons and tactics and the situation for the German U-boats changed quite drastically. In March 1943, U-boats had almost crippled Britain's Atlantic supply line, but by May that year, Allies had struck back in force, and 41 U-boats had been sunk, often with their entire crews perishing. From this point on, German submarine commanders had to revise their tactics, and U-boats largely withdrew from the Atlantic Ocean, operating instead in less populated waters like the Indian Ocean or the Pacific, where unescorted Allied targets could still be found. There, they once again proved effective, but they never again reached the effectiveness that they had attained in the early stages of the war. Life on a U-boat was uncomfortable for the crew, to say the least. The average deployment time of a U-boat mission could be anywhere from three months to six, and during this time the crew had to put up with extremely adverse conditions. 
the living quarters were cramped to the point of being claustrophobic and essential supplies like food and water were strictly rationed. Often the men of the crew could not even change their clothes for weeks. While the scarcity of fresh water, priority was given to storing diesel instead of water, meant that bathing and showering were forbidden. The crews operated on strict shifts of four hours, during the daytime and six hours at night, and with space being extremely limited, as soon as one man got off his bunk, whoever was switching shifts with him would climb straight into it. Only canned food could be taken on board, as anything fresh would quickly be contaminated with diesel fumes or simply rot. In addition to these extremely taxing living conditions, there was the added element of always having to be on full alert and knowing that a single torpedo strike or bomb dropped from an aeroplane could result in the death of everyone on board the sub. Not surprisingly, being part of a U-boat crew could wreak significant psychological havoc on a man's mind. In the end, while technology made the U-boats so effective at the start of the war, technology was also what ended up putting them out of action. The Allies kept upping their game against the U-boats and ultimately of the 1,162 U-boats the Germans constructed during World War II, 785 were destroyed. By the end of the war and the total casualty rate of U-boat crews was almost 7 out of 10 men. Nonetheless the name U-boat still rings with deadly authority to this very day. Today's extraordinary inspiration titled Gathering the Pack by Brian Wildfong is a stunning piece of work. A kit of a World War II U-boat conning tower cast in resin in a 135th scale with 10 figures on the deck all modified in some way from their stock poses. Painting was carried out with a mix of oils and acrylics. The water is a layer cake of foam insulation board painted watercolour paper gloss acrylic gel, medium and cotton from q-tip swabs for a foamy churn. The incredible amount of work that Brian has produced here is from a different level. Brian is a figure painter so you expect to see uh, particularly refined um, work and he hasn't disappointed in any way shape or form it's fantastic everything about it from the weathering on the conning tower to the water foaming up over the base of the conning tower is tremendous and i can't fault it in any way shape or form. I will now pass over to my usual music selection and allow you to have a proper look at this fantastic build. <laughs> Thank you. 
hope that you've enjoyed this particular inspiration. The work is just extraordinary and it's it's such a thing that you you bring a model kit and you turn it into a time slot of history. The U-boats were devastating throughout the beginning of World War One and World War Two. But the courage and bravery of various merchant navies and the British Navy and the American Navy, as well as other allies, made it possible to survive this. I really hope you've enjoyed this inspiration today. And if you have, please, please, please select like, subscribe, and I promise to get many more videos of inspirations, reviews, and other things up for you. As I said after the last inspiration, I have got a few things planned and it's going to be coming along. So I'm going to give you a quick teaser of that. But in the meantime, big thank you to Brian White Fong. And as ever, wherever you are in the world, be safe, take care, much magic, and of course, happy modelling. Here I am chatting away again just to let you know that uh, here's a little bit of a tester for you it's called military lines I'll leave it at that and I hope you'll come back to see more of the work that I, I make on it um, it's a very interesting project anyway ta-ta for now as they say much magic and hope you all Oh, just the best night's sleep ever. <laughs>